the name of this symposium is Chris O'Brien Symposium, and I'll spend a minute who Chris was and what we owe to him. So let me introduce Dr. Rowe. He is the co-moderator for this morning. Dr. Rowe. Thank you for Dr. Shah. Um, uh, welcome to the Chris O'Brien Symposium. I'm Yang Su Ro uh, from Iha University, Seoul, Korea. It's my great honor to be a co-chair as a uh, as a Shah. So you know the everybody knows the Shah. He's the general secretary secretary general of this organization. So. So I'm going to briefly introduce the, the speakers. The, this is not a symposium. This is a case presentation uh, guided by the, the Ashok Shaha. So, so I just uh, introduced the speaker's name. The first speaker is Mona Sabra. Uh, she is working for the uh, endocrine service in Memorial Sloan Catering Hospital. And uh, Ian Nixon is a Head and Neck Service, Memorial Sloan Catering Center Center. Now he's working in the uh, United Kingdom. The uh, Marcus Lust is a he is a nuclear medicine specialist uh, working for the University Hospital Kissen and Marlboro. Uh, last speaker is uh, Michael Tucker. You know everything. He's a lot of, he he published a lot of papers. So he also working. Uh, endocrine service of the memory Sloan Catering Hospital. So, because of time of li time lim limitations, uh, I'm going to finish this introduction here, and uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Ashok Shah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rowe. Can I have my slides? Once again, welcome. Um, we're going to make fun of this uh, symposium this morning. We're going to enjoy, as we always say, sit back, relax, and have fun. So we're going to tap our uh, panelists. It would be very difficult, you know. I, I tried to ask all the panelists um, about their presentation, and everybody said, I, like, I need one hour <laughs> to defend my point. I said, if we do that, we will not finish the meeting. So I, we have decided to do this case presentation based so that we can ask all the experts their opinion. There are two surgeons on the panel. You can see here Ian Nixon and Dr. Rowe is actually a moderator. So this panel is already imbalanced. We have got three endocrinologists, nuclear physicians. I don't know why we need three people on the panel to discuss a simple point that low risk thyroid cancer does not need RAI. Very simple. I don't know why really, these people I, I have got, been invited. I got up for this. this is Dr. Shaw said you were going to treat me nice. Oh, I'm going to treat you nice, very nice. People will know you are the best person. You are the most leading endocrinologist in the world today, after Mona Sabra. But that's <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Ian Nixon, he's uh, one of the leading head, uh, thyroid surgeon in London, trained at Memorial. The data that I showed you yesterday of more than 5,000 patients was analyzed by him. He wrote the papers, I took the credit. That's the way the academics work. Uh, okay, so um, this um, particular sy uh, symposium is a tribute to Chris O'Brien, who unfortunately passed away some three years back. He was uh, one of the most leading head and neck surgeon in the world. He died at a very young age, below the age of 60, had brain tumor. It is so sad that uh, we lost one of the leading head and neck surgeon in the world. He was generous and extraordinary human being, an excellent surgeon, a family man, extremely courageous, a great teacher, friend, and colleague. And as uh, the um, Australian media would say, he was Dr. Gorgeous. I want that title once for me, you know, <laughs> Dr. Gorgeous. This is great. He was a great leader and obviously an innovator. Uh, this is my picture with him. Now you tell me who is a gorgeous amongst the two. Obviously, myself. Okay, this is Chris with, uh, as a family man with his lovely wife, Gail, who has taken the leadership in Australia to develop the Life House and the Cancer Center in Australia. It's amazing what the wife can do for the cause of cancer care. This is the Life House which has come up in Sydney, Australia, 
a tribute to Chris's memory. Okay, so I just want to uh, uh, start the monologue and then we'll get to the questions. Uh, there are approximately 45,000 papers in the literature on thyroid cancer. Every two hours, there is one new paper on the literature on thyroid disease. By the time we go home this afternoon, there is one new paper on thyroid cancer. And half of those papers come from this panel. You know, they write the same paper again and again and again. You know? <laughs> the paper that I wrote 30 years back, I write it again. Once in a while, I write it in Hindi. It becomes another peer-reviewed paper. Then I write it in Chinese, another peer-reviewed paper. But that is interesting. More important is, this is what we call 20 million Google sites. Every patient who comes in your office knows more about thyroid cancer than you do. They spend two hours, they teach you everything about thyroid cancer. And at the end, I say, you know what, honey? I, you taught me so much, I'm not going to charge you today. You know, because I learned so much from you. That is one group. And the other group who comes and challenges me for everything. I say, we'll do a needle biopsy. Why? Why do you do that? The Google says no, Columbia says this, the South America says this, and it is so difficult. That is not thyroid consultation. I call it thyroid confrontation. You know. We fight with the patient all the time. Believe me, eventually we give up. So the standard treatment in the United States or all around the world for a long time was total thyroidectomy uh, for every thyroid cancer, do the radioactive iodine and suppressive therapy. Even the ATA guidelines in 2009 said, if the tumor is more than one centimeter, do total thyroidectomy. I think it's amazing how the things need to be changed and probably will be changed with a good reason. And I think that's what I'm going to tap from the panelists, what they feel about it. So we'll go through some more details. When a thing ceases to be a subject of controversy, it ceases to be a subject of interest. So the major debates are extent of thyroidectomy for primary tumor. Do we do lobectomy or total thyroidectomy? We'll talk a little bit about the prophylactic neck dissection. This subject was never brought up in any thyroid symposium 10 years back. I have no idea what happened in the last 10 years. The disease didn't change. The doctors didn't change. What changed? I don't know. But in only we have been talking about thyroid neck nodes only in the last 10 years. We didn't talk about this subject before. Uh, I do need to talk about Delphian node. I'm one of the gurus in Delphian node. We wrote about it, so I strongly feel about it and the lateral neck dissection that we heard yesterday. So the question is, why is there a debate? Dr. Tuttle, I'm going to ask you a question. I want one answer. Uh, there will be only 10 seconds. Why is there a debate? Why we have gotten together this morning, early morning? Because all of the excess treatments that we're doing make no impact on their outcomes. Very nice answer. Did, you, did everybody get that? Mike, say it again. I don't think the word went around. And can we <laughs> tape record this so we know? We can show the patients. You don't he need to see an down. endocrinologist. He wrote that down for me to write. <laughs> you know, okay. I read it, so it's good. Great. So you heard that. The excess treatment has no impact on the long-term outcome. Marcus, why is there a debate? Because this gentleman to my left is living in his own small world, <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard to transfer his, his uh, thoughts to the real world. Okay, Mona? <laughs> because we'd like to actually offer the minimum treatment to the patients without causing any side effects on the long term. And oh. so if we can actually do that, that's what we try to do. Okay. Did everybody hear Mona? She's the most soft-spoken in the group. So <laughs> we had to bring her to the surgery, you know, round. So, okay. Um, Ian? It's okay. Because I think we're starting to recognize that we're over-treating patients and we can offer them excellent outcomes with less aggressive therapy. Okay, so the two points which come out of this is we don't need over-treatment or excess treatment, as, as uh, Mike said. And what Ian said was that most of these people don't need to go through over-treatment because there are some side effects and problems and complications. I think this is a very important take-home message why there is a debate. Um, these are the reasons why there is a debate. The results are equally good whether you do a lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. Most of the patients are in the low risk group with excellent prognosis. The uh, role of adjuvant therapy remains unclear today. Keep in mind, as uh, Ian said, complications increase with extent of surgery or extent of treatment. 
there are no prospective randomized trials on this subject. This is probably the only cancer issue where there are no prospective trials. Nobody has ventured to start the prospective trial. And more importantly, we need to realize there will probably be no prospective trial in our lifetime. Because if you do, want to do it, it's going to need, what, 25,000 patients followed for 25 years. I'll be dead before that. I think majority of the panelists will be dead before that. So you won't be able to get any correct answer. And the most important thing is the understanding of the biology is very critical. I think the philosophy of management of thyroid cancer in last 10 years has become what we call as individualized, risk-based, or precision treatment. Any comment from the panelists? Dr. Rowe, any comment? Well, same as those. Uh, the most big problem in the thyroid surgery is uh, we need a long-term follow-up and uh, much variety uh, is, uh, exists for the analysis of the data. Okay. data. Thank you. So the, yesterday I showed you the 80% rule. Today I'll show you the 20% rule. <laughs> Only 20% of the people will remember 20% of what you said 20 minutes after the lecture. So when you attend the next panel on thyroid, you had have forgotten everything we said today. Okay, what is a low-risk thyroid cancer? Let's start. Mike, what is a low-risk thyroid cancer? That's a subject of the debate this morning. Yes, I, I think this is really the crux of the matter. And we've seen now a move away from this one-size-fits-all of everybody getting the same treatment to now individualized treatment. And so when we say low-risk, we have to know what we're talking about. In the past, I think it meant intrathyroidal papillary cancers. And we would all say that's low-risk. In the new ATA guidelines, we're going to propose a modified system that actually moves very small volume lymph node metastasis to ATA low risk. Minimally invasive follicular tumors with only capsular invasion to low risk tumors. Encapsulated follicular variants of papillary. So this definition of low risk is moving past papillary microcarcinomas to include some other very discrete pathologic entities, including small volume lymph node metastasis. So when we're talking about low risk, I think it's really important that we know what group of patients that we're talking about and to make sure Marcus and I are talking about the same group of patients, the okay. low-risk patients I see in my little world versus the low-risk patients that he sees. Marcus, is there a size criteria of the primary tumor when we call low-risk? I think size matters, but, but uh, as Mike uh, just pointed out, uh, I think it was a great uh, achievement. I had a, a glimpse recently at the ADA guidelines that it is, of course, a continuous spectrum with many factors impacting on, on the risk uh, stratification. Uh, also including new molecular signatures, and we're hoping for that to, to catch up. Okay. Mona, Mike just made a comment. The small volume nodal disease. He didn't say anything more than that. I don't know what he meant. Can you define <laughs> us? Your job is to interpret Mike, okay? <laughs> Lucky for me. Uh, so small volume uh, nodal disease that would be considered low risk would be uh, less than uh, five or 10 lymph nodes that are affected, less than one centimeter in size. Uh, okay. Ian, you have any thoughts about small volume nodal disease? Yeah, I think from a surgical point of view, um, the literature on nodal disease is, is complicated because it, some papers find they have an impact, some don't. And I think that probably that's related to bulky nodal disease that you can detect preoperatively or intraoperatively does have an effect on, on outcome, whereas uh, electively detected occult disease has very little impact. And so I think this is a very nice and easy description from a surgical point of view. The nodal disease that is documented preoperatively or gross nodal disease at the time of surgery is not a low volume disease. But the disease that you have done a prophylactic dissection or you cleaned up a couple of lymph nodes or there were a couple of lymph nodes that came with the thyroid, that's not going to have a major impact. Mike? Yeah. It, it gets even more a little complicated than that because we say if there's lymph node metastasis diagnosed pre-op, it's clinically significant. Well, maybe not. We saw in one of the panels yesterday showing three millimeter lymph nodes in the lateral neck, two millimeter lymph nodes in the lateral neck. So I think the concept is clinical in one disease that's significant disease. In older people, probably higher rate of mortality. In young people, certainly higher rate of persistent disease and recurrence. But whether or not this small volume disease makes any impact is hard to know. 
Okay, uh, I will come to you in a minute. Mike, is the number of nodes critical? The, the because the pathologist will give you the answer. There are five nodes positive or eight nodes positive. At what stage you say, hey, I'm not happy with this? Yeah, I don't know. So it's a continuum. So as much as I'd love to give you, if it's 5.1 lymph nodes, it's low risk. If it's 5.2, it's high risk. In my head, it's volume of disease. It's the number of lymph nodes. It's the size of the lymph nodes. And we've always used terms like bulky disease. Patients that present with palpable lateral disease, we knew that was a different patient. Okay. So I, I think as we go forward, we'll see more studies that try to draw a line. But it probably makes a difference whether it's lateral or central size lymph nodes. So in my head, it's volume without a discrete line. And that's why we described it as a continuum of risk rather than an absolute number. Okay. Marcus? This is where, where the inconsistencies uh, start for me. I still don't get the point. If you really want to know about lymph nodes, you have to get them out. If you want to know about the size and the number, you have to get lymph nodes out. Uh, would, you, would you advise doing a fine needle biopsy on a three millimeter structure in the neck? So how would you know preoperatively? Yeah, see, this is the problem. I don't want to know. Um, mem remember the good old days before ultrasound? And we thought all of our patients were cured, and they lived to be 99 years old. So I am perfectly fine not knowing that somebody has a two millimeter lateral neck lymph node. On the other hand, I do want a pre-op ultrasound before every patient, before every surgery, because but, we but do with get- with closed eyes or what? what are that's the trouble, right? So I want clinically significant disease taken out, but we do face this all the time. Somebody has a small lymph node, contralateral on the other side that is read as suspicious. So the downside is that we're doing more lateral neck dissections. That probably is not a great thing, on the other hand, when we do those appropriate pre-op ultrasounds, we get more people in remission. So that's the balance. Has, Mike, I'm going to put you on spot and ask you a question. Has the pre-op ultrasound changed the surgical strategy? In the past, when we, I saw a patient, in the, during my training, I, I would see a patient with three centimeter thyroid nodule. I examined, brought them to the operating room, did whatever I felt was appropriate. There was no discussion, much discussion about neck nodes. If I saw some, I took them out. Now we do the pre-op ultrasound. Without that, they don't go to the operating room. Is it an advance or is it a step back? It's worse than that. I mean, the, the post-op ultrasound changed the surgical strategy. Uh, because when I started finding persistent disease on the ultrasound six months after surgery, you guys started doing more surgeries up front that then led to the pre-op ultrasound because if the endocrinologist was gonna find that disease six months down the road, you wanted to take care of it at day one. That was not driven by improving mortality, improving outcomes, that was driven by finding disease that has to come out. So I think it's a two-edged sword. I okay. think we certainly put more people into remission if we do pre-op ultrasounds. We find lymph nodes that you guys just can't find in the operating room and you deal with them the first time. On the other hand, there's no question it's leading to more lateral neck dissections. And in these young people, you have to take a step back and say, are we hurting more than we're helping by doing that? Right now, I think we're probably still helping more people, but I'm still open to look at that. Okay. When the endocrinologist says that we may be hurting more people, I think that's very, very important. Okay. What is aggressive treatment? Ian, we use the word here, aggressive and uh, non-aggressive treatment. The whole debate is based on the, what is aggressive treatment? I think for people who deal with squamous Can cell carcinoma. Can you take microphone close, please? Uh, for, for clinicians who deal with squamous cell carcinoma, you would think any treatment of thyroidectomy uh, and radioactive iodine is relatively non-aggressive. Um, but I think aggressive treatment is, uh, is a relative term. And really, we're talking about the concept of whether or not to do a total thyroidectomy versus a hemi, whether or not to do a prophylactic neck dissection rather than observation, and whether to recommend radioactive iodine and I think all three are overlapping and uh, impact on each other, in fact. That's great. So I think if, just to summarize, what is the aggressive treatment? There are three points, aggressive versus non-aggressive. Extent of thyroid surgery for the primary, total versus lobectomy. The nodal dissection, prophylactic versus therapeutic. And the last one, which is whether we use radioactive iodine. And the one other point which we need to add, when we decide to give radioactive iodine, is it a low dose or a high dose? I think Marcus will be very happy to hear that, okay? And Marcus, I'm going to add there, low dose, high dose, and more importantly, no dose. So I think that's another important point. You want to make a quick comment on that, Marcus? Yes, but I, I believe that by definition, uh, nuclear medicine people can't be aggressive. Aggressiveness is reserved to, to, to our surgical <laughs> colleagues. So 
<laughs> I, I think are you a group of the endocrinologists or you exclude yourself <laughs> oh he so excludes himself oh, he's okay about to so he's a himself. nuclear physician okay no but but seriously i mean we're, we're moving towards lower amounts of radioactive iodine that's for sure especially in young females that yeah. that's and that's a great achievement just sure. recently sure by two, by two prospective studies few prospect as you alluded to there are only like two studies prospectively performed yeah. and that's a great achievement Mona, you want to differ from these two elegant endocrinologists, nuclear physicians, or you agree with them? I totally agree with them. Okay. Well, you know, because she is Mike's junior, she has no choice, you know. <laughs> Mike board, uh, b brought I her on board, so we have no yeah. choice. If you have a question, just make it 10-second question. Come to the microphone. Nobody will hear you otherwise. Please come to the microphone. We won't hear you. Make it only 10-second question, because we have got about... Talking ten, about... Dr. Dave from Bangalore, talking about aggressive. Most of the time, the central compartment disease is not removed a block. It is removed plucking up something. Then why do you not accept berry picking in the lateral leg when there is no continuity between the nodes? OK, we'll come to that point later on. So we'll hold this question, because we do have the whole case presentation on that. So just hold for a minute. What is conservative treatment? Mona, what is conservative treatment? Uh, providing the, the uh, minimum treatment possible to uh, support benefit without causing a lot of side effects. Okay. Everybody agrees with that? Okay. What is appropriate treatment? <coughs> okay, Mike, it's pick what it I, up. It's what I think is right. <laughs> so, so I, I, I can't. Uh, so appropriate treatment, I think, brings that balance between being appropriately aggressive uh, Ashok's got a slide that says we don't want to miss the boat. There are some people that have aggressive disease that you don't want to be conservative. You want to treat up front because you get better. On the other hand, many of these low risk patients, it's okay to be wrong. If you're wrong, you'll figure it out on a thyroglobulin in six months. The ultrasound will change in a year and you can still salvage those patients very, very well. So appropriate treatment is balancing the risk and benefits, making sure the high risk patients get all the treatments they need while minimizing the low risk patients, but not ignoring them forever. Because remember, this definition of low risk can change over time. We're usually right when we guess somebody's low risk, but sometimes we're wrong. And you'll pick that up in six months or a year. And in the vast majority of the time, you can come back and use your aggressive therapy at that point, and the overall survival is gonna stay the same. Okay, so let me raise these questions so we understand why we are spending so much time on the debate. What is the outcome in the low-risk thyroid cancer uh, uh, group? Disease-specific survival. Marcus, number. Less than 10% less than relapse. Sorry? Less than 10% relapse, that's the outcome. No, I'm, I just want disease-specific survival. We'll okay. come to the relapse in a minute. What is the survival in this group? In our hands, it's, uh, you, you mean like all patients or including high risk? No, 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 Lo only low risk. Low risk. We're okay. going to so talk this low risk, only it's 90, low risk. 99%. 99%? Yes. Okay. Anybody disagrees with that number? No. So now I think I just want to bring up this slide. What is a relapse-free survival? Ian? Less than 5%. So Less than 5% relapse. Relapse, yeah. So your survival is 98% relapse-free, almost. Yeah, yeah. Ten okay. Years. Yeah. Local recurrence, Mona? Uh, less than 10%. Local recurrence, less than 10%? Yeah. Ian, you agree with that? Local recurrence, thyroid bed recurrence. Yeah. Okay, so you're using surgical <laughs> terms. You use the real terms. So thyroid bed recurrence Correct. is going to be much lower. But no, not regional recurrence. When we talk about local, I no, know you guys thyroid like... Thyroid bed recurrence. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the points that needs to go in the literature and in our debates, when we talk about recurrent thyroid cancer, we need to divide it into, is it in the thyroid bed recurrence or is it in the lymph nodes? I think that's a major difference. The lymph node recurrence is much easy to treat, number one. Very little we have a control on that. No matter what you do in the beginning, even RAI may not have a major control. But the thyroid bed recurrence, which is in the soft tissue of the thyroid bed, is a surgical issue. That means I didn't do a good operation first time, number one, or I did not appreciate the extra thyroidal nature of the disease, which I did not uh, do a good operation and the patient recurred. So that's a big difference. So Ian, go back. What is the local recurrence in, let's say, thyroid, low-risk thyroid cancer? So 
a well-performed extracapsular hemithyroidectomy will more or less eliminate local recurrence. Okay, so um, the incidence of local recurrence is extremely, extremely low, low, probably less than one or two percent. Yeah. There may be some lymph nodes in the thyroid bed which may confuse you with the local recurrence. Yes, Mike. But now, Dr. Shah, we, we know that's not true. You, you just said if you do a lobectomy, you only have a one or two percent recurrence in the contralateral lobe. But every pathologist in this room has published there's a 30 or 40 percent incidence of papillary microcarcinoma on the other side. What's, what's the truth, Dr. Shaha? Well, I think, I think his point is good. Looks like we are arguing. I'm a moderator. I'm not a panelist, okay? <laughs> you can't ask me questions, you know? That's why I became a moderator. You know, if I knew the answers, I would have become a panelist, you know? I forgot okay, so I was at a surgical meeting, sorry. <laughs> See, See, this is not the time for Mike to come to the hospital. You know, he generally comes at 10 o'clock, you know. He's worse than the bankers. Bankers work 9 to 5, he works 10 to 4, you know. That's a great job, you know. So if Dr. Shaha chooses just not to answer my question, that's a problem, right? I mean, if you do a lobectomy, we have to recognize that we might be leaving microscopic disease behind, right? How many people are okay with that? Yeah, I'm totally okay with that. Because sometimes it will be wrong and they'll grow something, and I think you're actually right. Yeah. The likelihood of growing significant disease, even when we follow with ultrasound, three or four percent. I, th I think the point that Mike brings up is very important because, we, and I think the way Ian put it, if we do a lobectomy, but sometimes we will do a total thyroidectomy, that time the recurrence in the opposite lobe issue doesn't come. You are absolutely right, and we'll we'll come to that in a minute. Let me just. Go back one minute, if I could. Uh, distant recurrence, less than 1%. Everybody agrees? Okay, let's move on. Uh, so the idea is to avoid over-treatment. I think that's the idea. I showed this slide yesterday. We avoid over-treatment and major issues related to surgical and medical morbidity. And I think we, I don't need to go in the details about the complications, but the nerve issue and the hypoparathyroidism is probably the most complicated subject. And the one thing you learn, this is a surgical trick. When you have a patient with permanent hypoparathyroidism, send it to Dr. Sabra. She's wonderful in management of these patients, you know. So we don't have to worry about how to manage these people. So let me just move on to case number one. This is a very straightforward case. The 25 year old, 24 year old medical student, she's aspiring to be an endocrinologist. Yeah. See that? Yeah, yeah. We get that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> So what this young girl does, she says, I'm going to be an endocrinologist. I want to learn how to do the ultrasound. She does the ultrasound on her own. The most, most of the thyroid nodules we see are incidental lomas, car accident, MRI, the ultrasound. Never attend the ultrasound course. You know why? Because they will ask you to volunteer for your ultrasound. And believe me, there is a thyroid nodule there. So once you find it, you will go through the workup. Okay, so she gets an ultrasound. There is a 1.6 centimeter nodule with punctate calcification. She's a very smart girl. She gets a needle biopsy that is papillary thyroid carcinoma. So what is the pre-op workup? Let's start. Dr. Rowe, can I pick your brain? Pre-op workup, one, two, three. Uh, just an ultrasound of first. Okay. Uh, pre-op uh, thyroid function test. Okay. Sometimes uh, we need uh, the, the CT scan for evaluation. You need a CT scan? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, not, not all cases, but a okay, few fine. cases. So okay, we so need, uh, we need, uh, I think some we talked yesterday about the CT scan. I'll come to that in a minute. Yeah. So the, the workup includes thyroid function test as a routine test. I don't think they're going to make any change. And the ultrasound. Now, this is very critical. Ian, when we order an ultrasound outside, or a patient comes with an ultrasound, we're not happy. We repeat it, why? Um, well, I think it's important that you have the same person committing to the pre-op ultrasound report as yes. is going to report the post-op ultrasound because it's, it's a disaster if you get a post-op ultrasound and there's disease there that you feel must have been there preoperatively. So, um, I, you know, I don't think it's mandatory to do it, but it certainly makes you look better if okay. you have the same ultrasonographer doing both tests. Yes. I think the one point here is, once we have a diagnosis of thyroid cancer, and we're going to send the patient for surgery or definitive treatment, the sonographer will spend more time looking for the lateral nodes. 
If you are going to get an ultrasound of the thyroid for a thyroid nodule, I don't think the sonographer is going to spend enormous amount of time looking for the nodes. Am I correct, Mona, or am I? I would agree, yes. Okay, I like that. Uh, so, um, the preoperative workup is very simple. Any other uh, tests you need? Marcus, in, you need a thyroid scan, radioactive iodine scan? Probably not, but I would go for some lab results, of course. Uh, Marcus, you are from nuclear medicine department. When was the last time you did the radioactive iodine scan for the workup of a thyroid nodule? We, we usually don't perform radioiodine scan. If we, we come across uh, nodules, we perform a technetium scan, of course. And I mean, this is again hard to transfer to your environment because we get a lot of hot nodules, a lot of functioning nodules in the, due to the iodine deficient uh, uh, setting in, in our country. So I perform uh, technetium scans on a daily basis. That's routine for us. Okay. One, one of the things you already see a difference. So this 24-year-old in my head very likely has a completely normal contralateral lobe. Right. Um, in Germany, when you see a 24-year-old, what's the contralateral lobe going to look like most of the time, even in a 24-year-old? I just bought a new ultrasound device, and I'd come across nodules on every single uh, patient on the contralateral lobe. And, and if I may just uh, stay with that for a second, because you, in one of your prior questions, you mentioned what would be appropriate. And that's, this is probably the case where I would strongly recommend the patient to, to think about her future perspective, that this, this is a patient who is worried about her future, and I would probably uh, go for a complete thyroidectomy followed by radioactive iodine, and this is gonna be a debate here, but this is the typical case for me. She comes back like half a year, has a, a small tiny nodule on the other side, and she's gonna suffer forever because they're different investigators, and this patient is not gonna be happy. She's not going to become an endocrinologist because she's gonna break up, <laughs> and that's why I recommend going for a more or less aggressive treatment here. Okay. Yeah. So, Mike, she's in your office. She's a young girl. She's a med uh, medical student. She says, when should I have surgery? You know, this is one of the common questions patients ask. Uh, should I have surgery in one month, two months? What is my time allowed? Is there a right answer for that question? I, I'm not certain there's a right answer. I mean, we've got several good papers that say you've got up to a year to operate on clinically significant disease. Most of these people don't want to wait for a year. But a lot of times, if they're in med school and they're going to have a break at Christmas in three or four months, uh, there's no real hurry to do this. Okay. So part of that, though, is really looking at that preoperative ultrasound. Because in her case, I'm going to try to get away with a lobectomy if I can. But to get away with a lobectomy, the contralateral lobe looks, needs to look good. There needs to be no lymph node metastasis. She has to be the right patient. Unlike Germany, I don't think every one of these is going to develop a new nodule in the next six months or a year or two. If she's freaked out about that, you can just do the total. So as opposed to, because I'm already thinking, I'm probably not even going to give radioactive iodine. So if you're going to give radioactive iodine, you've already bought into the total, but there's a real good chance I'm not going to give radioactive iodine, in which case then I have to say, why am I taking out a contralateral normal lobe? So I think it does vary with the follow-up. I think this probably, point is very important. I'll probably I and uh, Ian can, can, can comment on that because I was quite impressed by the new BTA guidelines that you really define a time window when, when the surgical procedure has to happen. Yeah, um, well, certainly in the UK, you're, we're bound by government targets for that. But, I mean, I don't think they're very well mm -hmm. evidence-based, mm -hmm. to be honest, because, of course, this girl... 24 or whatever she is has found this incidentally so the uh, the idea that she just ultrasounded herself on the day that it, it appeared of course is is not true um i our experience in uh, um, in memorial of following these patients is that if you leave the contralateral lobe in situ there's about a 10 percent chance that that patient will develop a nodule that then needs further surgery and about half of those will go on to be malignant most will be the same histological subtype so she needs to be aware of that, um, but with the 90% chance that she won't develop disease in that lobe in that U.S. setting, which is different, I, I guess, depending on where you, you practice, then um, she needs to be aware that that's, that's an option to leave the other lobe. And I don't think either approach, the patient will do well. Yeah. Uh, and the pa this patient is not going to die of thyroid cancer. Uh, they're quite unlikely to recur. And it, it becomes a balance of how much damage you think your surgeon will do to them. I mean, that's, we don't, we don't talk about that very it's much. It's important. The, the moderator operates on most of my patients, so that gives this me pause. <laughs>
the, the surgery never does any harm to the patient, <laughs> you know. It takes away the so, bad thing. So I, I think, think, you know, even though this is a simple case, the decision making is so critical. And you the, heard the, the panelists. The, the real truth is we're choosing between two right answers here. Right. One right answer is to follow with the lobectomy and take the chance that I may need to do something down the road. The other right answer is to do a total thyroidectomy because we can do it in safe hands. I think that's the challenge. There's not one right answer that's going to make them live longer. And then you get down to way past 1.6 centimeters and you're into what does she want to do with her life and when does she want to get pregnant. Some of these people have had family members that had their thyroid taken out. They feel miserable. They don't want their thyroid taken out. Other people say, I bought my own ultrasound machine. I'll ultrasound myself every six months. No big deal. So those sort of non-biologic factors, right. I think, is what drives our lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy most of the time. I think, you know, even though this is a simple case, young girl, small thyroid nodule, there is so much to think about preoperatively and more importantly, to educate her and her family so that we make the right decision in the operating room. I think it is sometimes a knee jerk. There are two knee jerks in this case. One, do a total thyroidectomy. I don't have to worry. I'm a surgeon. I don't want to see her anymore. Send her to Mona and let her follow. So that is one choice. The second choice is I'll do a lobectomy. I'll keep my eyes open. I'll do a completion sometime in future. I think that is probably not the most appropriate choice. We need to make certain decisions why we are doing. The patient needs to be informed. The family needs to be informed. And they need to walk with you. And more importantly for a surgeon, if we are going to make these decisions, we need to make sure that our endocrinologist who is going to follow the patient is at the same wavelength. One of the problems we face, face in New York, this girl goes to different institutions. She gets a differing opinion, not because it is a right or wrong answer, but it's a relation between the surgeon and the endocrinologist. If I do a lobectomy on this patient and send the patient to one of the most aggressive endocrinologists, he's going to say, go and get your other lobe out. Mike, how do you resolve this problem? You take the other lobe out. The, <laughs> I mean, once one of you guys has told them they need a completion of thyroid and radioactive iodine, it'll take me an hour to undo that, and I will never undo that, and they will live with that nagging, I didn't get an appropriate treatment. So I'd give them 30 millicuries and be done with it, to be honest with you. If they didn't hear it and they don't want it, then sometimes I can talk with them. Um, I will tell you the new ATA guidelines that are going to come out this fall, I promise, um, say in these one to four centimeters that you can either do a lobectomy or total thyroidectomy, and it's a decision more, not only based on the pathology, but based on the disease management team. So specific into the recommendation, we say it's perfectly fine to do a lobectomy on a patient just like this, but if the team thinks they need radioactive iodine or if they think they need a completion thyroidectomy to facilitate follow-up, perfectly fine to do, to be able to integrate the, if we saw the exact same patient, what I did in New York may be different than what Marcus did in Germany, and yet still be exactly the right thing for that patient. Okay. So we're going to open that up away from having to do a total thyroidectomy on everybody that's bigger than one centimeter. Mike, you have been following patients for a long time, both lobectomies and total thyroidectomies. In a young woman like this, 25 year old, who is expected to live another 75 years of her life, is there a quality of life difference? in patient with lobectomy, with minimal supplement, or total thyroidectomy and lifetime true supplement? Yeah, I think there really is. I mean, if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I just thought, take the thyroid out, put them on Synthroid, everybody's going to do fine. And that's probably true for 80, 85% of my patients. But there's 10 or 15% of patients that just don't feel well. And when you really sit down and talk to them, they don't perform at full thing. Cancer patients accept whatever they get, and they're happy with that. But the more we're starting to understand the quality of life, how patients feel, is probably not the same without a thyroid. So I don't use that as the major trump to do lobectomy, um, but I think it is an important part of it. Okay. I think this is very important. I think everybody may not agree with this. All endocrinologists may not agree with this. But I do believe there is a difference in the quality of life of patients who take total thyroid replacement versus they have their own thyroid. God made a thyroid for a good reason. He Mona, made the what, thyroid so we have normal hormones. What, what do you think, Mona? You talk more to the patients than I do. You're more sensitive. Do, what, what do they say? A lot of the young people do not want to be on lifelong synthroid treatment for the rest of their life. So it actually makes a difference for them to actually have a chance not to be on thyroid hormone replacement. 
Uh, they're also, most of those patients are women. They're usually concerned about weight gain, uh, and that comes with total thyroidectomy and also being on synthoid with the different variation in TSH levels. So uh, a lot of the up women would prefer not to have a total thyroidectomy if they have a chance. Okay. Dr. Rowe, when you are operating on this patient, what are your thoughts? You open the patient, you are operating, you are told her that I'll do this or this. How do you make a decision what I want to do in the operating room? What things make you make a final decision? Yeah, another my concern is uh, that we don't know the, the histologic subtype uh, preoperatively. This okay. is an important decision. So some kind of paper, the popular cancer has uh, some the aggressive behavior. The, we don't know the exact histology preoperatively. Okay. That's, that's a major problem. Another problem is uh, if patients have Hashimoto thyroiditis, we cannot exactly evaluate the nodal status in the level six. Okay. So the well, well Hashimoto always brings some questions, yeah. you know, because if you know in advance that the other lobe is heterogeneous, you know sometime in future, in next few years, patient will come back with another nodule. Um, so I think the Hashimoto becomes a little bit difficult. Also keep in mind, the routine total thyroidectomy in Hashimoto is going to lead to higher complications. Marcus, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I was just uh, wondering about quality of life aspects because, I mean, when, when we talk about quality of life and want to put ourselves in a patient's uh, perspective, we, we also need prospective studies there because just, just mentioning that I have a feeling that 10, 15% don't do well is not evidence-based. So uh, this, this should also be balanced uh, against, let's say, impact of the sheer diagnosis of cancer and the uncertainty what's going to happen in the future in this 24-year-old for the next 80 years or so. So also, we, when we talk about patient perspectives, we need hard evidence there. Okay. So Ian, you're operating on this patient. Uh, let's get a few scenario. You look at the primary tumor. You have made a decision. This is a well-contained tumor. You are probably going to do lobectomy. Uh, she has no Hashimoto's. Um, what do you do if there are no suspicious nodes? You just go ahead and do a lobectomy. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's take the other scenario. There are some suspicious nodes on the same side. What do you do now? They look suspicious. You are not sure. Do you take them out? Do you get a frozen section? Do you do a standard uh, paratracheal dissection? And if you do it, what is the extent of the dissection? Make it 10 seconds. I think if you find macroscopically suspicious nodes and you're in a setting that supports it, a frozen section is very useful, and then you can proceed to do a central neck dissection at that point. Okay, so if there is a suspicious node, you will take a frozen section. Well, in truth, I wouldn't. In the NHS, we wouldn't be able to persuade a pathologist to report one. Uh, but um, I would proceed to do a, a, a central neck dissection in that setting. Okay. Mike, what, I, I pick up the phone and I call. I'm operating on this, your uh, 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 cousin. There is a tiny node. I don't know what it is. What should I do? And what is your advice to me? Well, you guys have published, right? You can't tell suspicious nodes from cancer and benign. This has been looked at. So what you guys are, at least the MD Anderson group, I assume everybody's the same, that you call it suspicious, it might or might not be thyroid cancer. So if you're operating on every little small suspicious stuff, you're going to do a lot of neck dissections. Okay. So, but I think you're stuck. If it's a clinically significant node, one centimeter, half a centimeter, you can't ignore it. You're going to end up doing something. And when you have this argument about prophylactic central necks that I fall on the stay out of there, don't do it category, if you know on purpose you're leaving nodules, lymph nodes behind in there, I'm going to have to follow those with an ultrasound. So in that setting, I'd rather have you just clean them out, even if they turned out not to be thyroid cancer. They're those Hashimoto's lymph nodes. So I think you're stuck if you have clinical in one disease when you're in the operating room, either with a frozen section or doing something about it. Okay. Let me see the audience. What do they think? If you have a patient like this, 1.5 centimeter papillary cancer, young girl, pre-op ultrasound is normal. There are no suspicious nodes. In the operating room, there are no suspicious nodes. Let me make it clear, no suspicious nodes. How many of, will, how many of you will do routine prophylactic nodal dissection? Routine. Wow, that's a unanimous decision, one or two people, okay. How many of you will take a couple of lymph nodes and get a frozen section? Okay. So for the non-suspicious nodes, there is a general consensus 
we don't do anything more am i getting the sense like that everybody agrees okay let's change the scenario as i ask ian there are some suspicious nodes now you have two choices number one get a frozen section number two do a routine paratracheal dissection so there is a suspicious node about half a centimeter it is firm how many of you will take that out and get a frozen section how many of you will not do a frozen but just proceed with the prophylactic nodal dissection okay i think 50 50 i'm going to add one more scenario here okay you did one side there were some suspicious nodes there is nothing on the other side how many of you will do a contralateral prophylactic nodal dissection let me repeat the question there is suspicious node on one side there is nothing suspicious on the other side how many of you will do routine do routine contralateral uh, clearance i'll come to you let me just get the number how many of you will do routine contralateral clearance a few claudio 10 seconds my name is claudio Thank yes you, claudio sanea from sao paulo or uh, new york no, the, the only word of caution is i like to have uh, preoperatively the thyroid antibodies because if the patient has thyroiditis okay you have to be cautious about uh, lymph nodes good point i think this is a good point if the patient has that's what we were talking the hashimotoid thyroid if their antibodies are positive you probably are dealing with hashimoto and the nodes may not be metastatic tumor there is a slight difference claudio the nodes in the hashimoto are more globular they try to herniate you know you put your clamp they herniate so that is just a clinical judgment but you i completely agree with you you get a frozen section okay so you're doing the neck dissection level c six level seven this is totally confusing and I, the, AJC, uh, the AJCC has made it more confusing. You know why? Because they said level 7 is 1B, which makes them stage 3, or sorry, stage 4. So that has become very confusing. I'm sure in the next staging system, they should change it that 1B is not a bad disease. So uh, Ian, how do you decide how low you want to go? You can go almost up to the Karina like this. Yeah, I this is great. So this is this is a 24-year-old that probably just needs a lobectomy, <laughs> and now we're talking about how deep in the mediastinum we're going to go. I'm, I'm just, glad you asked. I'm just being question, clear Mike. about this because so we've happy. just done an ipsilateral neck dissection. That's I'm I'm so happy you brought it up, and it is good to hear that the endocrinologist challenges us for aggressive surgery. And this I'm is my happy. cousin who I happen to like, and okay. <laughs> probably dated in Kentucky. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I agree that uh, level six versus level seven is a bit of an arbitrary cutoff. I mean, this is, she's going to have a nice supple neck. She'll be able to bend her head right back. Level seven but before, will be like before level surgery. Six. You mean <laughs> pre-op? Pre-op. Yeah. Yeah. She'll be a little horse post-op. Um, <laughs> little so, horse. <laughs> so I, I think that is impossible to answer what you should do, but. The, the, the problem you have as a surgeon is you, you say, well, there's a suspicious node. You can't leave no, you can't close your neck yeah. leaving what you consider to be disease. And there is no perfect way of telling whether it's malignant or not. Frozen section may be useful if, if you've got that available. But even that's not perfect. I think uh, Dr. Erkin presented some work uh, uh, last year showing that as you become more senior and more experienced, you're better at picking up metastatic nodes but even then it's uh, it's not a it's not a science really um, so you just have to do what your gut tells you is right in terms of how low you go then I think if you're gonna commit to doing the central neck you you may as well commit to doing it and, and clear down to the innominate artery okay so if you're going to do the paratracheal clearance either therapeutic elective whatever you want to do you go as low as possible am I correct I think the worst thing you can do is do half a neck dissection get a post-op scan and there's no, no low disease, are still low there. I think that's very important. That's, that's, that's why I never send the patient to the endocrinologist. They do keep doing ultrasound. Just keep them with you. That's what we did 30 years back. They were all fine. If they recurred, they recurred. No problem. They lived with that disease. They died with that disease. Now we don't let them die peacefully. You know, we try to do all these things in between. Okay. So what is the chance this lady with five positive nodes, Ian, has a lateral node that is not seen on ultrasound? And if you are going to do a neck dissection, you would find a positive node. Yeah, she's, 
She's high risk of having, whether she, we think she has suspicious nodes in the central compartment, she's got at least a 30% chance of having nodal disease. She's got a, a reasonable percent chance of having contralateral microscopic occult disease. Okay. And I think we have to be comfortable and we have to move away from this feeling that you have to remove every somoma body okay. in the neck. Um, and uh, so you have to be comfortable leaving it in the lateral neck because very few units are doing okay. elective so, lateral. So I think it is, it is appropriate to say some of these people will have microscopic disease in the lateral neck. They will live with it, grow with it, and probably 5% of them will become clinically apparent who will require a surgery sometime in future. I think it's interesting in the last 15 years we are seeing more and more re-ops for both central compartment and lateral com neck. We didn't see this before. No. Uh, do you, again, I think the, the follow-up has changed quite a bit in the last 30 years. The clinical follow-up is rarely the final follow-up. We do the ultrasound, we do the thyroglobulin, we do a needle biopsy, we do a thyroglobulin assay on a needle aspirant. So even if we are not able to prove, we're making every effort to find the recurrent disease. The problem is at what stage we want to do something for that or we could monitor these patients. Okay, um, we, we did talk about the decision. Of, so Mike, I'm operating on this patient. This is your cousin. There are five positive nodes. I can see them. Would you tell me on phone, hey, Shahar, take out the whole thyroid? Or am I happy like a Japanese approach, do a lobectomy and ipsilateral dissection? Uh, a, you got to stop calling me from the operating room because I'm probably home watching TV. <laughs> so... Got to stop doing that. Uh, yeah, the reality is if you've got positive nodes, I think you're better off just with the total thyroidectomy and don't get clever about okay. it. I still, I still might or might not use radioactive iodine, but I'm going to want a post-op TG. I'm going to want an ultrasound. So Good point. if you found, because remember, these are not going to be millimeter nodes because you don't do prophylactic neck dissection. So these are going to be nodes that you can see and feel. Uh, that'll be clinical in one disease. And then we'll have to look at the number, extranodal extension, size, post-op TG, and then make a decision about whether or not we're going to use radioactive Good iodine. Point. Marcus, coming to you. We kept you quiet for a while. Six positive notes in the yeah. final report. Um, don't read the next one, okay? Just six positive notes. I'm not talking about uh, lymphovascular invasion. Radioactive iodine, yes, no, maybe. Certainly. I mean, I just learned that this is Mike's cousin, who he dated when she was age four or so. No, no, no. I mean, that, that was she 20, was year, 20 years ago. Okay. <laughs> And, and, and there is no doubt that this patient will benefit from radioactive iodine and a low amount of radioactive iodine. That would probably go for, for 30 millicuries or 60 millicuries, something like that. But okay. uh, positive notes, two centimeter uh, PTC, that's a clear indication for me. But Mona, is the, is the patient going to benefit or are you going to benefit? What's, exactly. what's, what's the benefit to the patient? She's got a 99% survival rate. Yeah. Um, what, what's the benefit? Yeah, I get a post-ablation scan, which is also very, very helpful, and uh, I eradicate all the cells that uh, your surgeon has left behind. So um, she's, she's going to survive forever, of course, but she's not going to recur. Okay, Mona, people always say, you know, a patient say, and the many doctors and endocrinologists say, hey, let's just give a little radioactive iodine and make sure everything is clean. Is that a good statement, good approach? Let's just give a little radioactive iodine. I mean, you can give a dose of radioactive iodine and have a post-therapy scan and make sure that you do not, do not have any distant metastasis. But there's no proof uh, that in a 1.6 centimeter papillary thyroid carcinoma with small, low-level lymph node involvement uh, that you are actually benefiting the patient uh, in this situation. So uh, I would not necessarily go with radioactive iodine unless there are other reasons to give radioactive iodine in this situation, like a high thyroglobin level after surgery, presence of vascular invasion, or, uh, or any other factors. I okay. mean, there is no proof. It's probably a little, little harsh here. I mean, there, <laughs> there is no prospective study, if this is what you're referring to. But, but there is some data out there, and probably have only six minutes left, so, so we should not start this discussion here. Okay, Michael, the final pathology report shows lymphovascular invasion. What yes. does it mean, and what, how does it change our philosophy? It just, it just raises the possibility that there's a little higher risk of distant metastasis. And in fact, she may not be a low-risk patient. So in that situation, with that on there, having that post-op scan to know there's no distant metastasis lets me truly classify her as low-risk. 
It helps if her thyroglobin is undetectable. In our hands, very often these patients already have an undetectable thyroglobin from the surgery alone. But if I've got one of those mid-level thyroglobins, three or four or five, that raises that specter, so I need it for staging. Okay. Can you tell me, Ian, when does a low-risk thyroid cancer that you have operated changes into intermediate or high risk? What are the yeah, features? I, think, I, I mean, I think that's critical here is that we, we, we say, say we're talking about low risk. Um, and this girl has gone from being considered low risk to, um, I would say, an intermediate risk. I think we have to be specific about what we mean by risk. Her risk of death is very low. Her risk of recurrence, I would say, is, I don't know, 10, 15 percent, something like that. So if, we, if we're willing to call that intermediate, then I would consider her intermediate because of the nodal findings, really, rather than anything to do with the primary disease. Okay. A question? Yeah, but it's, uh, uh, considering this case, if I uh, would like to, to stage the other case of the coin, one fundamental is that you are dealing with the gap. Papillary thyroid cancer in such patient is a gap. It's not because we see what we are doing, because we get from the same organ the disease that kills within months. This is a gap, and very rarely we get a gap. Second, the philosophy of treatment should be cure and not survival, because 24 years old patient, I'm looking for cure when she become at 60. This may make a little difference in approach and uh, approaching this case and dealing with it. And I think the UICC, I mean the NCC guideline should uh, change the survival in thyroid cancer, in differentiated thyroid cancer, so we cannot miss this patient. This patient you will follow, and how, for how long you will follow. This is the important thing we have to consider. Well, I think every thyroid, I'll just answer on behalf of the panel, every pa patient with cancer would be followed for the rest of her and my life. Once I die, somebody else will follow. I think that's a standard philosophy. What happens is over a period of time, the follow-up timing changes. And based on the features that Mike has described very well in the literature, that the risk of recurrence changes uh, in follow-up. The first year, you know what is going to happen, if the thyroglobulin is high, if the ultrasound is abnormal. So I think we get some idea about how these patients are going to do over a period of time. I think we've got three minutes, so we need to kind of uh, uh, wrap up and uh, uh, just want to show you a few slides so that I can conclude. Uh, there is, you, go ahead, what? Mr. Chairman, will you take a question? I'm sorry, I didn't see you, sir. Oh, uh, I, you know, the light is so no, no, bright no, no, no. I see, I, that I didn't see I, the halo around you. So. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Dr. Shah. Uh, can we, uh, if, if I want my paycheck, next paycheck, yes, sir. <laughs> I was going to remind you that your promotion is still in my hands. <laughs> I got okay. your chair. Go ahead, sir. Uh, the question is, in this uh, discussion throughout the past hour, I heard no comments about thyroglobulin. Okay. Post Michael? Postoperatively. Oh. Yeah. So I have three questions pertaining to that. Uh, uh, one to Dr. Tuttle. Uh, Mike, uh, does thyroglobulin have any value postoperatively in a lobectomy patient? Hmm. Question two uh, to Marcus. Uh, any, do you do routine postoperative thyroglobulin? If you do, when do you do it? And do you pay any attention to it in deciding whether you get radioactive outdoor treatment or not? And the third question is to Mona. Mona, you have a patient with a total thyroidectomy, low risk patient. Postoperative thyroglobulin is 1.2. What do you do? Great questions. I think before we conclude, <laughs> let's get the answers. Great, great questions. A minute, 40 seconds. Hey, we, yeah, I was supposed to get an extra hour there. He is, he's yeah. in charge of this. Charge. Short, short answer is yes, TG is helpful after lobectomy. Uh, in the vast majority of my patients, because we properly choose lobectomy, they've got normal contralateral lobes. Their thyroglobulin is usually somewhere between 5 and 10 and it stays right there. So you're looking for some major increase. These patients are already low risk, so you're not looking for something low. You're just making sure it's not high. So we still follow that over time with lobectomy. Okay, Marcus? 
Regarding uh, TG for decision making, of course it plays a major role and uh, we, we just came, uh, with a, came up with the term delayed staging. So in, in especially the estimable study, 50%, almost 50% of the patient were TG negative before radioiodine treatment. So one could question if radioiodine treatment would still be adequate. So that would heavily influence our decision making. But I don't come across those patients. We don't have TG negative patients uh, after surgery in our hands. And the ATA guidelines is going to endorse using post-op TG six or eight weeks afterwards in the decision-making process. Mona? So TGF 1.2 around six weeks after the surgery is not a very high TG and could just reflect a remnant that is left behind after the surgery. So my inclination in this situation is to actually follow the patient if there's no clear indication for radioactive iodine and then see them again in six months and follow up the TG trend over time. Okay. Keep in mind the decisions about whatever we do in thyroid is not based on you alone. It's based on what the patient knows, which endocrinologist the patient has seen, how many surgeons she or he has seen who has told them that the best treatment is total thyroidectomy. And the last but not the least, what does the Google tell the patients? <laughs> patients come prepared. You, you know, we spend more time when we have to do lobectomy because we have to convince them why we do it. We have to convince them that this is the best approach. And if you don't have your endocrinological support in your institution, that is not the right operation. Patients will be very unhappy. We send more lobectomies to Mike Tuttle. He cleans up for us, but he tells them that what we did was absolutely right. Keep in mind that we do need to keep in the equation the complications. The more totals we do, the more paratracheal dissection we do, the more complications we are going to see. A conservation approach is not to treat all tumors by limited operation, but tailor the extent of the procedure to the biological characteristics and extent of the disease. This is very important. This is a take home message. Let the punishment fit the crime. More importantly, let the punishment not be worse than the disease. I think this is very critical in a 25 year old girl who may become maybe 2% chance permanently hypoparathyroid. I want to read this slide and then we'll spend only one more minute on Chris O'Brien. The commonplace clinical problems in medicine are approached in a diametrically opposite ways by the physicians with a similar training background, read the same literature. But what do we do? Why we have this debate? Because we interpret available information differently based on unique personal experience, vision, and the most important thing in medicine is prejudice. We have a philosophy. We, we have a tradition. This is what I have been doing. I don't want to change it. And I think most of the time it works very well. What we need to do is to balance between the treatment and the outcome of the treatment. You don't need AK-47 to kill a mouse. You know? You've got a small enemy, you can easily take care of it. You, you don't need uh, an elephant to kill an ant. You, know? you can easily kill an ant very easily. So we got last one minute. Uh, I think it would be most appropriate for me this morning in the presence of the entire audience to recognize this one of the giants in the head neck surgery all over the world, Chris O'Brien. Chris passed away a few years back of brain tumor. It was one of the saddest days in the life of all the head and neck surgeons around the world. A man with great vision, a great personality, as previously I mentioned, Dr. Gorgias, uh, we lost him. Uh, before he died, about I think a year back, before he wrote this book, Never Say Die. He f fought with his brain tumor almost four years. Uh, unfortunately, we lost him at the end. There is a cancer center in his memory, which is coming up in Sydney. His wife, Gail O'Brien, has done a remarkable job in carrying on Chris's legacy. Uh, this is Chris O'Brien with Kevin Rudd, the Prime Minister of Australia. I think uh, uh, Mr. Rudd was very fond of Kevin, uh, uh, Chris O'Brien. Um, and this is the only surgeon that I know where the, his eulogy was given by the Prime Minister of the country, and it was a state funeral. It's amazing how a surgeon can achieve in his life at a very tender young age and be the leader in the country. It is his determination, his passion, and his honesty that led him to what he was, Chris O'Brien. And the last thing, 
This is the stamp that has come up in Australia in the name of Chris O'Brien. Chris, we miss you today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>